Hi, and a very warm welcome to this video tutorial. I'm Chris Watson from Endor Learn and Develop, and we're a specialist provider of behaviourally based learning services. During the programme today, we're going to focus on developing a, a deeper understanding of what's been called the language of work. Now, as you can imagine, this is a, a very large topic. So let's have a look at what we're going to cover. It is worth pointing out that the session certainly isn't about undermining all of the hard work that you've already put into your academic studies. There's no doubt that the pursuit of qualifications will always support the delivery of long term career aspirations. However, recent evidence does suggest that too much emphasis on formal outcomes alone may unknowingly result in people underestimating the very skills and approaches that are required to succeed long term in employment. So for this reason, this session is also about an exploration of what these specific skills and approaches are. And research from the Results for Life report by the Prince's Trust reveals that 43% of final year students don't feel fully equipped for working life. They're concerned that they lack many of the transferable skills required to succeed in a job. Now, many institutions are of course working hard to address these issues. There's a much greater emphasis on work placements, commercial awareness sessions, and ongoing assessment techniques. However, the language and terminology used by many employers to describe performance expectations still remains a mystery to many young people. And some people have also suggested that there may be a disconnect between the day-to-day -day skills needed by employees in an organization and what some young people are regarding as valuable when they leave education. So here at Endor Learn and Develop, we've been really interested in exploring whether or not this is actually the case. Each year, we're lucky enough to work with hundreds of workplace learners, providing them with practical ideas to extend the performance in role. And there's one exercise in particular that may provide clues as to what employees themselves regard as valuable at work. And it's called the Caribbean Holiday Challenge. And we've probably run this exercise hundreds of times with many different groups and every conceivable department but we always get the same results. So what's the exercise? Well, we ask each person to imagine that they've won a six month, all expenses paid, holiday of a lifetime to the Caribbean. As part of the conditions of the luxury break, they must help to appoint someone to do their job, i.e. someone who's gonna provide cover for the period of time that they are away. Now, getting this right is critical because their professional reputation and their income is going to be determined by the caliber and the quality of the person that's employed to backfill for their position. Uh, now, the only way that they can find this person is to identify potential candidates through an online recruitment portal that human resources have already set up. We've also completed most of the job advert for each person with information about the organization, how to go about applying, but they've asked the winner of the holiday to select the 10 best words that they can think of to describe what the ideal candidate will look like, i.e. the person best suited and best able to fulfill the requirements of their own role while they're away. So we then ask people to take a few minutes to reflect on what these 10 words would be, i.e. the words that they would use to describe the skills and approaches of a peak performer in their role. So let's take a look at what happens when we run this exercise. And this was filmed at a recent meeting of the Chartered Management Institute with apologies for the quality of the clip. And I want you to think about the attributes of a peak performer in role, whatever it is you do, whether you work in logistics, whether you're in HR, whether you're a line manager, whether you work in recruitment, what are the qualities and the attributes of a peak performer? 
Flexible. Flexible. Fantastic. I've got a communicator. Communicator. Approachable. Lovely. I've got self-motivated. I've got some of those can-do. Can-do, yeah, can-do actually. Nice. Motivator. Motivator, right, yeah. Mentor. Lovely. Humble. Humble, okay, great. Um, an innovator. Innovator, yeah, <laughs> yeah creativity is nice. Reliable, nice. And confident. Confident. Lovely. I'm actually going to stop you there, if that's it. Unless someone's got a real burning one, you know, this is, this is critical for. Success in a role, burning one that I haven't managed to share yet. You hate me said it, but I say objective. Objective? Oh, okay, no, I think, uh, I think that's a fantastic uh, aspiration. Can we have a sense of humour? Sense of humour, yeah, definitely. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Now, I will stop there on that, uh, on that little funny bone. Um, because this is it's, it's a really interesting thing that happens. Um, what you've provided is, is probably uh, an even higher percentage than what normally happens with this exercise. The feedback is captured, as you saw, on a flip chart, but unknown to the group, the facilitator splits the responses into two columns. So attitude and approach-based responses are positioned on the left-hand side of the flip chart and technical skills and knowledge-based responses are located on the right-hand side of the flip chart. As you'll have seen, the vast majority of the responses captured every single time with this exercise always relate to attitude and approach and not to technical skills or even knowledge-based aspects. In fact, typically we tend to get a result of 80-20 with 80% 80 of responses relating to attitude and approach. And that suggests that these are the themes that employees value the most in their own work practices. Yet here's the perversity. Traditionally, companies have tended to recruit based on things that they can find evidence about. So knowledge, experience, technical abilities. Now it's true that all of these are important and all of these will get you to the door. However, what seems to happen is once you're in the door, these become less and less important in terms of your professional reputation and how, how promotable you become. Now this small scale exercise may offer some indications as to what a few hundred people each year regard as valuable work skills. But how does this marry up with what employees want, say, from a boss or a leader in their workplace? After all, as capable people progress within the organisation into management and leadership roles, don't the staff below them expect to see different qualities and different skills? Isn't it the case, for example, that people move into more senior positions by really knowing their stuff? Well, perhaps not. Starting in 2008, Project Oxygen was Google's attempt to see if there was a huge variation in the quality and caliber of the managers that it employs. Also to see what employees themselves valued most in their managers. Reviewing all of the data, which came from surveys, performance reviews, exit interviews, they identified eight common characteristics which staff at Google admired most in their boss. And once again, what people were expecting to discover was that people would value their technical expertise, their boss's knowledge base, especially in a technical environment like Google. However, what they found was technical ability after all, the defining characteristic of many Googlers came in last. Google had discovered that it was the same type of attributes, the same adaptive skills that we've just heard about, which consistently came towards the top of the list. In fact, the number one thing employees wanted from a manager 
was someone who supported them, someone who empowered them and someone who acted like a coach at work. It wasn't to do with their knowledge base. So once again, we see that it ain't what you do, but the way that you do it that really makes a difference. And following a number of similar high profile studies recently, there is increasing support now for investing in the human side of work. Even the head of the UK's leading association for HR professionals, the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, acknowledges the sea change that's now taking place. Now, so far, we've looked at just the employee perspective, plus we've heard what they would like to see in their managers. But what about the organisational point of view? What is it that organisations want from their people? What are the skills that they find most attractive? So this question made us wonder whether or not it'd be possible to run something like the Caribbean Holiday Challenge on a much bigger scale. So instead of just dealing with a, a few hundred people, perhaps open it up to thousands of different organisations and see whether or not there are some commonly cited skills and approaches. And in this way, try to discover if there were recurring themes which could be identified. And driven by this desire to isolate the skills most valued by employers today, we secured funding from the Knowledge Transfer Project and set sail on a longitudinal 10 year investigation into the skills organisations most want from their people the skills which they associated with successful outcomes at work. Now, this was no mean feat because LinkedIn have estimated there are at least 50,000 different workplace skills to choose from. During the course of the study, we received feedback from over 8,000 different businesses. So ranging from SMEs to complex manufacturing organizations, which employed thousands of people. Then with the help of academics at the University of Hull, we evaluated all the results to see whether or not there were any transferable currencies which were being valued by all types of organisation. What we found was actually quite surprising. The same 21 skills came up time after time, irrespective of industry type. Now it's true that some different organizations did place a greater emphasis on some of the 21 skills over others, but there were these skills which were commonly cited time and time again by each and every company that provided feedback. So let's take a look at what these 21 skills are. Now, it's hard to question the validity of these results because not only are thousands of companies saying the same thing, and these companies represent hundreds of thousands of workers collectively, but also the results are mirroring what employees are saying that they value the most and indeed what they want from their bosses. In fact, we often challenge people to critique the final 21 skills and try to find one that isn't of use. Looking a little bit closer, this makes sense though, because these are all transferable skills. So they can be used by many types of jobs because they're personal qualities and attributes 
that will help people to work well together and also make a positive contribution in the workplace. And this is the case whether or not you're a, a new starter, an apprentice, or indeed a, a senior leader or a CEO of an organization. Now, once again, just to underline, this isn't saying that technical knowledge and technical skills aren't critical at work. Of course they are. It's just that these are the 21 skills which will add value to any role and at any time in your career. And part of the reason for this is because these adaptive skills aren't role specific and they're not project or task specific. So what does all of this mean to you right at this moment? Certainly it is useful to know the very key skills which will help you throughout your entire career. In addition, when applying for a job, these results suggest that wherever possible, you should always try to express your accomplishments and previous achievements in terms of these 21 transferable currencies. And there are also consequences for the people who may end up interviewing you. Ever mindful of the importance of these more adaptive work skills, recruiters have refined their selection practices. And this means that the good old days of let's have a flick through your CV or resume are now long gone. Most recruiters will, of course, still check that you've got the required qualifications to fulfill the expectations of a given role, although much of that can usually be identified at the application stage. But now they also go on to a much deeper exploration of your own approaches and work preferences. And this is to see if there's a good fit, a synergy between you and the wider team or the wider organization. And competency-based interviewing is often used to explore this. It's been around for some time and involves a, a detailed assessment of the specific role in question, and then the development of a battery of situationally-based questions which are linked to role requirements. And this way, it explores your likely responses to things that you might encounter in the job. And the assumption is that the past behavior is the best predictor of how you're likely to act in the future. It's also harder to acquiesce and present a, a false impression to the interviewer. And critically, it provides them with an evidence base that they can then rate and score. And competency-based interviewing can even be used by focusing just on one single question. This is an approach adopted by a number of Fortune top 500 companies in the States. And this type of killer question is applied as the foundation for the entire interview. And in this way, the, the skilled CBI interviewer would probe each and every response in detail to uncover more and more insights and then rate each answer in turn against a predetermined scale. And here's another behaviorally based technique called the question evidence learning method or QEL. And in this situation, the interviewer poses a, a role related question. Uh, this one here might be to do with resilience levels at work. They would then ask for specific evidence around this and then encourage the candidate to reflect on what they themselves have learnt, what perhaps they would do differently next time, and other opportunities to improve. And similarly, another three-step questioning technique is the QEC, which is question, evidence, and contribution. And contribution is all about what recruiters are after i.e. opportunities to identify attributable behavior to that person. And it's based again on the assumption that past performance is a reliable indicator of future potential. So they might ask things like, what was going through your mind when this happened? What did you do? What did you say to others around you? And what were you thinking at that time? And the key tip is to always emphasize results over responsibilities. So while developing your CV, the, the cover letter, right through to the face-to-face -face interviews, always stressing the points of difference that you've made rather than a list of tasks that you've undertaken.
because this is what every employer actually wants and is interested in what you've achieved rather than what you do because the interview is thinking how will this person make a difference to our organization if we employ them if we just take a look at these these two responses to the same broad question it's so clear that the second answer is far more powerful and moving forwards now and here is the final suggestion for today it is true that we can't always choose the jobs that we do especially in today's highly competitive marketplace however you may still be able to exert some influence over the type of company that you want to work for so with this in mind i'm going to finish with a, a simple onboarding strategy uh, which i love sharing and it's a well-known story about david ogilvy who founded ogilvy and mather and they're one of the world's largest advertising agencies and he firmly believed that one of the single most important things you can do as a manager is to identify and develop talent he gave all of his new employees on their first day a russian doll so each new worker would find the doll on their desk on arrival and open each of the dolls in turn until eventually they'd get to the smallest doll right in the middle and inside they would discover a handwritten note by david ogilvy himself which said if we recruit people who are smaller than ourselves then we will become a company of dwarfs if we recruit people who are bigger and better than we are then we will become a company of giants let us be giants and this personalized statement from david ogilvy conveys two messages firstly it says welcome aboard and you're now part of something bigger but also that we believe you have got the talents and capabilities to achieve great things so how does this relate to your own situation well in terms of future career choices why not deliberately look for companies who are fully committed to developing their people it doesn't need to be a plc or you know market leaders in their field just a strengths-based organization who are equally committed to developing your skills your talents and your abilities who they themselves want to be giants because in doing so what you're doing is giving yourself the best possible chance to develop and grow in your career particularly armed with the understanding that you now have of what really makes a difference at work so this brings us to the end of this short tutorial on the skills employers value the most and i hope that you've picked up some valuable insights and ideas which can be applied during your career if you would like any more information on anything that we've covered or would like to share some of your own experiences please get in touch via the endorlearning.com website and i'll do my best to get back to you and once again many thanks for watching